Welcome back to my podcast, Quilt Along with John. Today we have a very special lady, Kim Suleiman from Six Penny Memories. Hello, Kim. How are you doing? I'm absolutely fine. It's wonderful that you've asked me to join you on your podcast. How can I not? You're so amazing. I absolutely adore your work. You have got such a resume. You were definitely one of the first people I wanted on here. Tell people a little bit about yourself, because some people may not know who you are. Okay, so I live in Whitley Bay, which is a little town just on the northeast of England. And I like to have said that I've been quilting for over 25 years, John, but I actually did the calculations the other day. It's over 30 years. Cannot believe it. So it just a phase then, really, isn't just it? Just a little phase, yes. So what happened was I used to be in the police force and I got injured on duty. And as a result of that, I, I had to leave the job and decided that I wanted to buy a cushion that was in Laura Ashley, which at the time was over forty pounds, which probably equates How to about much exactly. And I, even at the time, I thought I am not paying forty pounds for a cushion. If I'd bought that cushion, a I wouldn't have got into patchwork quilt. It would have saved me a lot more than forty pounds. I'm sure. I the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I was not able to just wander into a class or. There was no such thing as YouTube videos and, and social media. And so therefore I had no way of finding out how to make that cushion. And I entered into the City and Guilds programme, which was, I was lucky enough that there was a one at the local college to me. However, when I did the City and Guilds class, I, I loved the technique side of things because that's what I wanted to learn. I loved the patchwork and quilting techniques, but at that time, yeah, you used to have to do an awful lot of design boards because that particular programme crossed over into, to, into several city and guilds qualifications. Um, so I didn't like that part. I didn't really want, be wanting to paint leaves and things like that and make boxes. So I left there with my city and guilds qualification and decided that, yes, I did start, my, I did start the cushion, which ended up to be the, the first quilt using the wrong fabrics, I hasten to add. And I started to do a lot of voluntary work because I thought I've got all of this um, information has been given to me. I need to share it. So I started to share it at community centres and, and got little groups together. And as I say, at the time, we had one shop in the northeast, um, which was a lady who was based right in the centre of Newcastle. And that was it. We, we're so lucky now. We don't realise that mm -hmm. we have so many resources available to us now. Um, so, yeah, so that's how I started. And as a result of um, enjoying the patchwork and quilting, then my daughter, who at the time was wanting to do a business studies course qualification, she needed the business to study, said, Mom, why don't you open a little shop just for six months? And then I can do my business studies and, and, and get my qualification. You could have a wonderful stash. We'll close it after six months. Everybody's happy. That's what we did. Oh, my God. I love that. So you opened a shop yeah. just to get a stash. I love it. <laughs> the, the, the shop was open for a long, long time. We only closed the shop three years ago. And heck, the stash. <laughs> so, so, yes, that's, that's a very long-winded explanation of how I started. And how, what, what, what the, that was Six Penny Memories? No, that was the Fat Quarters. So my bricks and mortar shop was called the Fat Quarters. And that was based in um, uh, Chopwell, first of all, the Blackhall Mill, which is the west of where I live now. Um, and yes, Emma, Emma worked with me for a long time in the shop. She was my Saturday girl all the way through university and she helped build the, the, the brand. And eventually, after her finishing university, she went off into that one thing. And, and we were at the time probably the biggest um, quilting shop in the northeast. Uh, it was an old co-op building, so it wasn't just physically bigger. Um, but I, I brought in a lot of the American ideas where lots of samples were hanging up, um, lots of kits. We used to, I mean, some people might think it's clutter, but we used to have a lot, lot of little vignettes so people would be inspired when they came in. And of course, had to have the, every day we used to have a, a workshop, whether it be a specific teach teaching workshop, you know, very structured, or it would be just literally a, a get together the Tuesday nights were my favorite because wine was introduced <laughs> and <of> course, <laughs> as it normally is in quilting groups <laughs> yeah I lived above the uh, lived above the shop at that time and um and so I didn't have far to go so I, I we used to have a wonderful time so it was very social I made a lot I've made a lot of friends through quilting um but I 
you know, I enjoyed the teaching. Emma left the business and it was too successful really at that point and too popular um, to have taken it away. And then there was a lot of other quilting shops did, did sort of sprout up afterwards, which is great because I think I'm one of these that think the more, the more is better. I oh, completely agree. And one thing you touched on there, which is so important, I think a lot of people who haven't been able to get to America to see the American shops, they are so different mm -hmm. and so enormous, absolutely huge. Like most of them have got two or three levels and you'll have these wonderful quilts mm -hmm. hanging over balconies and everywhere you look is something, as you yeah. say, like a little vignette or something there or a little cushion or something, which yeah. as you, is a class and then you can buy the kit and yeah. it's amazing what they do. Yeah, we, I wonder we if that had to do with the space. It, it, I mean, we were really lucky that we had the space to do that. But from day one, we, we were in a very small unit. But from day one, we always had that vision. Um, and there's a couple of magazines that um, were published then in America, which I used to get. And we used to look at them and, and lots of props and, and lots of sort of fabric draped. And, and I, I used to work really hard. And, you know, I, I've always worked hard on samples because I believe a sample in a shop particularly should either have the fabric and or the pattern available. I don't want to go into a shop and see samples and think, oh, I want to make that. You can't. Sorry, we haven't got the pattern, we haven't got the fabric. And if that that's really hard because I have that issue myself is that you yeah. make the sample, you buy the fabric, you do some bundles, then everybody's bought the bundles and then you've made the sample, which has taken weeks. Yeah. And then you can't actually get the fabric again to do it because everything's that's so right. quick now. Yeah, and that's and that was always a challenge I set myself. I mean, I really set the bar very high because that's that's what happened in America. You never you would never go into an American shop, and you probably still won't now, and walk in and say, I want to make that, and it not be there. It will yeah, be there. It will whether it you might not be able to get the exact fabric, so you could have the pattern, but you certainly would have something, and that was that was something other than one sign, which I one little hanging which I had, which was um, it was always better to start something new than finish what you what you'd already done. That was the only thing that ever stayed in the shop that wasn't a sample that I could I could replicate again for the customers. So yeah, so I, I did. It wasn't a nine to five job. We all know anybody who has a shop knows it's not a, a nine to five or a ten to four job because you are working behind the scenes, making sure that you can inspire people mm. when they, you see all those bolts of fabric. You need to be inspired. Um, so well, the it's number very of people important. now, my shop's tiny. I'm 523 square feet. I've maybe got a thousand bolts of fabric. It's not that big. And I know when people say they hear a thousand bolts of fabric, they think, oh my God, that's enormous. But as a quilt shop, that's really small. It so is. When yeah. people walk in, even with that, because yeah. I've got them four high and the solids on the top, people are just like, I have no clue where to start. And uh -huh. you need that little bit of inspiration. And it's really hard to find it. Yeah. I mean, I used to always keep my fabric in ranges as well, because I do think that a designer has gone to the trouble of putting a palette of fabrics together. Not only the designs, you know, you've got your larger, your smaller, your medium designs, you've got your um, your shades have all worked together. And it wouldn't matter what you picked out of that range, it's going to work. I, I really it's really interesting you say that because yeah. I do exactly the same thing. So if you want all the Libs Elliot, there they all are, the Juicy yes. Juice, the Alison Glass. You've got all yeah. of them in one collection, but everybody else is doing it, all the oranges together, all the pinks, oh. but then you've got to go through and find it all. So that for me, enough. I'm definitely, you and I are on the same side there. I prefer doing the ranges. because even. But I do it by designer, so I'll have all the Juicy Juice yes. in one, and there'll be like five or six collections. Yes, yeah. And they all go together, which I love. yeah. yeah. I mean, I used to, um, it was a laugh because when the reps used to come in, I got to the stage where you didn't even need to tell me the name of the designer, you know, which because they work in a particular palette or a, a style. But Very doing that, fun. what you're doing, John, immediately is giving your customers the confidence because people say, oh, I can't choose my fabrics, but they can. They walk out every day and they get dressed. They put together a combination of colours and clothes that they, they love. And it may, other people may love it, but it doesn't matter. The, exactly. They love it. Exactly. So and how me, many times have you had a customer come in with a palette that is not your choice, but when you see it work together and the joy in their face yeah. with it, it's not what you want, but you don't have to live with it. It's there yeah. and you've got to work with them to make it work for them. That's exactly. Many years ago, I'll tell you a story. I won't name the person, but she was a very, very well-renowned quilter in the Northeast. And I went up to a, one of her uh, classes and she was doing a, a, a particular, it was like a sampler. And this lady had 
brought along with it the the brightest i'm talking brighter than that orange fabric the teacher threw the fabric back and said you cannot do that well i pulled her to one side i wasn't i wasn't that confident i certainly wasn't in the you know on the on the level that this particular lady was and i said just go with it just you do it oh my god her quilt was absolutely and utterly stunning and that little bit of orange she didn't use a lot of it mm. but she used it just as a little accent it wowed that quilt it was just amazing so yes go with what you like um what and I what doing... I hate about that story is that it's the confidence that that woman had to oh. do that, to oh. have it knocked. It's really exactly. hard. That's And that's the top and bottom of it. When I used to do the children's classes, which I have to say were probably my most favourite time of the week, I used to have a rule that parents and grandparents who often had to accompany them because we had them from five year old were mm. not allowed to interfere at all in the selection of their fabrics. So I used to bundle... I maybe I always pre-cut because when you've got five-year-olds, you're obviously oh, yeah. on the sewing machines as well. And and I used to put the fabrics in the middle and then we'd pick them out. And then you would get the grandma, or the mom used to say, Oh, do you really want that? Yes, leave it. To the point where I used to swap parents or grandparents around with different children because they interact with when it's not their own. But you know, the kids, I used to think, oh my goodness, they're never gonna go. But they were brilliant and it was theirs. And this is how we all learn. Because I'm in my safe place. I'm in my sludgy colours because I love those sludgy mm. autumnal colours. But every now and again, I come out of it and I just think, wow. And if you didn't embrace what other people do, then we would never, we would never change. But the thing is, as well, I, I hate the word sludgy colours because it does, unfortunately, paint it <laughs> really well. But they can, look at the quilt behind you. That is gorgeous. And oh. that's on the sludgy range. But it is, is it? one of the most beautiful quilts. I'm literally sitting there looking at it and thinking, oh, I want to make that. That's really lovely. <laughs> Whose pattern is that? It's so pretty. It's it's my pattern, that one, actually. Is it yeah. really? Yeah, yeah, I've just put it back together. Yeah. When, when I was on um, In the Shop or when I was on TV, I mean, In the Shop was slightly different because you're selling patterns. So you can... You, you can do other people's patterns. When I was on TV, um, the majority of the time I would create a pattern and I wouldn't necessarily know what I was going to do. Um, often I'd pick the fabric six, nine months earlier, as we all do, and then the fabric would come in. Sometimes I knew in my head roughly what I wanted to do as I was selecting the fabrics, but then often I would just come together and fiddle around and try and basically give people different techniques um, but everybody, when they bought Fabric Off TV, always got a project um, with their fabric bundles. Um, that was sort of my USP, really. And it was just, you don't have to make that particular pattern. But if you are a, a beginner or a confident beginner, isn't it nice to have something that you think, oh, I can make that. Or alternatively, I'll pop that in my little library and then sometime later in the life you you'll get the pattern back out again so yes so that is one that is my pattern yeah and that's what a lot of people are doing at the moment is their reorganization of their sewing rooms their craft rooms all the patterns are coming back out again and how yeah. many times do you turn an old pattern and think oh actually my Alison glass would look amazing in that pattern or right. something new that's come out in an older design it's just perfect because that yeah, is a classic I love that and I'm a very classic traditional patchwork if the truth be told I love those original blocks I love playing around with blocks um but I always come back to the traditional I, mm. I mean don't get me wrong I'm very I'm very inspired by some of the contemporary quilts but a lot of the contemporary quilts are just one block expanded it, it still goes back to those traditional blocks um I got I a think fabric the best description I've ever heard is uh, a lady made a massive mistake on her quilt and she'd sewn one of the um, like with the flying geese the wrong way around and she said oh I'm leaving it I'm just going to call it modern <laughs> which I loved I that was so brilliant that's superb yeah absolutely superb yes and let's be right some of it these designs some of these designs that have come out have been because it's a happy accident that's what I exactly. call it. happy I, I used to say to people look if you're happy with it just leave it it's it's yours at the end of the day it's made it unique <laughs> exactly and no one else has it no, now you mentioned you've been on telly. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, I'm afraid there was alcohol involved with that one. So um, many years ago, um, um, I wrote a book 
called um I couldn't remember there Coleridge is I want well, what I was with a, a lady called Debbie Garland and we wanted to basically write a book um coming up to the age of 50 and decided that we were sick of the templates the templated books if you look at the majority of quilting books that are out there they all follow the same template and they have a lot of blank pages and I didn't like that at all so I was at Harrogate um at the knit and stitching show many moons ago and decided right that's it we'll write a book so we went to um to the printers basically think that you could just walk in and, and print a book but you can't you need to there's a lot more that goes on to it and this man um took great sympathy on us because we went in with we don't want that we don't want that we don't want that don't want that don't want that this is the ideas that we wanted for long story short we ended up um writing quite a number of books all based in the northeast um, all photographed in the northeast and the first one colliery days we had a print run of 500 and the reason for that was that was the minimum we could really have to make it fairly affordable and um and we thought well friends and family are going to have these forever we don't care how successful they are thankfully um search press picked the, the book up uh, we self-published we always self-published and they rang us up and said, can we have 3,000 of those books? So we went back to um, the printers and said, cancel the 500, we need 3,000 now. And then the print room went on because it ended up in America. So long, this is a long explanation. We did the trade show in America first with the book. And then we did the trade show, which is in February. It's called Stitches in Birmingham. It's just been actually this year. And if you've got something new, they have a, an area where you can just stand and the, the, the stands are, are a lot less expensive. And we were standing there and the buyers from Create Craft approached me and said, would we go on TV? And I was like, oh, well, that'd be good. That'd be good for do once <laughs> because it means that we'll get the shop, the shop, which is the fat quarters. We'll publish the book under Six Penny Memories and we never put our names on. We always had it down as Flory and Betty. And the reason for that was if there'd been an unmitigated disaster, nobody would ever, ever come back and find, and find out who'd written the book. <laughs> we used to lie. I, I used to stand in the shop and lie. Who's written this book? Oh, I have no idea. Flory and Betty. And <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. I love it. Five books were written with the name of Flory and Betty. Flory and Betty used to go to all the meetings with, with everybody. I mean, they went, these two dolls, they had their own persona. Um, so, yeah, so that was the reason that my name has never, ever gone into a book. And that was because if it was so bad, nobody would ever know who. They... But it's one of those things. It was then a massive success. And then obviously you can't then go back and say, well, actually. No. So even on TV, we used to... I, I, so Crane Craft asked us to go down, went, went on, went on once. Um, the book sold. I mean, it just, it went absolutely mental, the sales. And then they asked us to go on to ITV. So went on to ITV. And at that time, through the sort of early hours, they were broadcasting craft shows. Went on there. It went, it went mental on there. America picked up the fact that we'd done it in uh, all of photography at Beamish. They then had a wonderful link with um, Beamish Museum. We were on the, I was on the Ricky and um, Ricky Tim's um, show, the quilt show over in America. I mean, it was just, it just went absolutely mad. So as a result from doing one show, um, and this is many, many years ago, um, we end, ended up being a regular occurrence once a month on Create and Craft. Um, I spent my first spell eight years on Create and Craft and then Hachanda were formed. That was a new TV company and I was, headhunted to go across there which was lovely and I have to say uh you know to build your confidence up because I don't particularly think I'm, I'm that good shall we say it was like oh the want the want so we went to her chand I were there for five years and then creating craft the CEO Jamie came back to creating craft and he rang me up and said would I go back to create craft well again being asked is rather lovely and um, so I went back to create craft and were there was there for three years um, so that's eight, it's a lot of years, but 16, 17 years I've done on TV, which is a, a long, long time. That's um, a really long run. It is. And I hit 60 last November and decided that 
thank you, <laughs> that it's at the age of 60 that um, regular TV, doing it twice a month, which doesn't sound a lot, but when you're so buying and prep, and remember I used it's to do samples. Whole, it's all the samples. samples you've got to make and then pack every, all the orders afterwards. It's a lot. Every two weeks, you know, it was such a lot. So what I've done is I've retired because Six Penny Memories was TV and the books side of things. So the shop closed three years ago and in February of this year, February the 28th, actually, Six Penny Memories as a company buying and selling has closed its doors. However, because I own the trademark, I own the name, I'm going to keep the social media going and I want to do things like I'm doing a, um, a free um, block of the month, which hasn't really been a block of the month of the truth be told because so much has gone on, but I will be picking that back up again. And and I've been, I've been asked to represent other companies, which is wonderful. Um, so I'll still be doing things. I'm still going to be teaching, which is where my passion is. And I may still pop up on TV, but not on that regular, every couple of weeks, bit of a hamster wheel um, on, on TV. So this. So I had a look. How exciting. Have you thought of doing another book? Um, no. And I, 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 what happened was, I think book sales really went down. And I know a lot of people are still producing books. But do you know what it was, John? A book would have maybe 20 patterns in and would retail for, say, $12.99, $14.99. I would do a pattern, a single printed pattern, and that would sell for between $7.99 and $9.99, depending on the content. And we did realise, and the TV company actually did sort of funnel it, why are you spending all that time doing a book with 20 projects in for that amount of money when you can sell a pattern for that amount? So from a business point of view, it became more viable to do patterns um, and then what I did do was I put a lot of my patterns as PDFs. COVID opened up a lot of avenues for people. So a lot of my, my, um, my PDF patterns used to be available. And I just need to think of a way now of, of making those available because I had a lot of free ones um, as well as paid ones. Um, so, yes, yeah, so COVID changed. The, the, the business models changed from, from books because you know how much time it takes to write oh, a book. Oh, it's, it's worse than giving birth to a baby because every <laughs> single thing has to flow. You've got the yeah. story going, can you tell I'm working on this very hard? Yes. But you've got to have that whole yeah. synergy and the thread yeah. going all the way through it and a fabric yeah. line that you're able to then stock at the end because you know everybody's going to want it. Yeah. It's very hard. People don't understand the, the difficulty of getting it right. And, I mean, we were very very lucky because the first few books um we were supported by a company called Wyndham Fabrics who are now available in the UK readily again uh through um the company who's bringing them in are called Mutex who are actually based in South Shields now Wyndham Fabrics were amazingly supportive because they they do produce a lot of civil war era type fabrics some right are, up your alley yeah so some are reproduction fabrics and some are newer designs but in that sort of that theme and what they did was they gave us things called strike offs so as the fabric first goes to its first print run they would then send over a yard and yards and yards but of every single one in the range what that meant was that you could get your sampling done and all your projects done for your book well in advance of the fabric actually being launched so there was a bit of a synergy there between the book being launched and the fabric being launched it also the, the one downside if you're ever using strike offs is sometimes the colors aren't exactly how they will be on the last you know the, the fabric that you'll be buying in the shop and that's because they'll tweak things but for the purposes of photography and getting samples done then they're never a million miles away don't get me wrong um so yeah so i was i was very very lucky that i was supported by Wyndham fabrics um for the books and I couldn't have done it any other way to get the book and the, the fabric out at the same time in America and in the UK as well. So, yes, and that's so it was, incredible. Being able to have that is so rare. It's wonderful. Yes, they're, they're, they're an excellent company. They've been around a long, long time. And I'm absolutely delighted because they did fall off um, the sort of spectrum for a wee while. I mean, don't get me wrong, that they've always been available in the UK, but not as readily available but now new techs are bringing them in i was i was really happy and then really sad because it was just as i was closing down i'm like <laughs> but i can pop across them well i was going to say i might have a word with new techs you can come down and stroke them in my shop there you go <laughs> <laughs> i'll always find a compromise <laughs> 
So, Kim, what's next? What have you got planned next? Obviously, retirement is beckoning. I don't see you well, being the type of person to retire. No, I don't think I'll ever retire completely. So, I am an ambassador for Bleaserlead and very proud to be. So, Bleaserlead, not obviously all your interfacings and interlinings. Um, I'm lucky to um, do a lot of the Facebook lives, but also, and it's now launched, the YouTube channel has been launched, and I'm actually the person, the face behind the YouTube channel. Um, so, yes. So what will happen is the YouTube channel's only be, been out for a couple of weeks, um, but we've got quite a lot of products in there. And the idea being that people won't just look at the Bleaseline products and think, what's that white stuff? They'll be able to see the name and go on to the video and know what it is, how to use it, how to apply it, et cetera, what the sizes are. Um, in April, we are about to, to start the next batch of videos. Um, they are going to be a little bit about techniques. There's going to be some projects in there. There's going to be some comparisons. So, yes, you want wadding. Well, what kind of wadding do I want? Do I want this one, that one, or the other one? Um, and they've got such an amazing range of wadding. That, that new that eco have. one is just special. Oh, and feet. the, um, I may or may not have been able to see a little bit of the new bamboo. Oh, well, it's I've got... Beautiful. Yeah. It is. It's a lovely, it's a 50-50 bamboo. It's wonderful. It's just about to be launched. I'm going to do a, um, a Facebook Live with regards to that this week, actually. But then that will also be featured on the YouTube channel. So I'm doing a lot of work with Bleaserine. I also um, have been teaching at, I've just come back from the Stitch Festival, which was in Islington. So teaching classes, um, basically an education thing, again, telling people about the, the different tapes that are available for the dressmakers. I'll be teaching at Festival of Quilts as well, using the quilt as grid. And then I'm at Harrogate at the end of the year, November, again, teaching with my Vlieseline hat on and demonstrating on people's stands as well. I've also I've been asked to be an influencer, which I just makes me laugh, I have to be honest, at my age. I, I don't know that. why. You've got five books, you've been in the industry for so long, <laughs> television for so long, you are an influencer. So, so I'm basically going to be working for a company called Falk, threads now paul who has superior sewing in um carlisle has set up a new company called thread essentials you're going to see that uh, i've just set the facebook page up these are some of the delicious colors that are in there i've used these threads for quite a while which is why i'll only ever go with something john that i really believe in that i'm passionate about that i'll use in at home myself well that's um, my you, philosophy as well you can't yeah. support a company if you're not using it yourself it's no. really important that that is what you believe in yeah so whilst I, yes I am a salesperson I have been a salesperson it's, it's something that I'm you know quite passionate about. I won't use anything unless I would use it in, in my own home so these threads I've actually I was sold quite a few of these on Crate and Craft they're a thousand meters and whilst they're an embroidery thread they are actually also ideal for anybody who has a sewing machine for decorative uh, sewing, but also I've been piecing with them as well because this, they're just beautiful. They've got a gorgeous sheen to them. So I'm and going to be nothing like with... a good universal thread that can do everything. Oh, that's right. And you know, just look the... at the sheen on that. That is it's gorgeous. Beautiful. I'm just Price. looking at that. We've got loads of embroidery machines, designs that I'm wanting to stitch out at the moment. Just look how that shines. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Then you've got the metallic threads. Now, anybody in the yeah, industry... I'm stopping will... looking. I can't look. No, no, I'm stopping. I love <laughs> metallic threads. Well, metallic threads, either they can be a love or hate relationship because the biggest problem with a metallic thread is it's that it's not regularly, it shreds. You can never get a needle that is happy, you're happy with. Now, I've tested these to within an inch of their lives. I've used a universal needle, which is normally a no-no. I've had them stitching out on my embroidery machine with th over a 1,000 stitches a minute. I've had no breakages, I've had no shredding. I've also used them decoratively. I did some Christmas projects last year and just did some decorative stitches on my sewing machine. And other ladies who've used them and gentlemen have, are just thrilled a bit. This is probably the best metallic thread that I've ever come across, I'll be honest with you. And the price, it's not extortionate because these retail at around about the 12 99 mark. For the metallics and then that's your not expensive that's a thousand meters a thousand meters and then your your other colors four pound fifty retail for a thousand meters of high quality thread i mean it's just amazing so i'm happy to be supporting that's a brand new business although folk have been around for 50 years and are based in and are based in italy 
Um, Fred Essentials, which is what you're going to see in the UK, will be a wholesaler. But I intend on that Facebook page and on the Instagram page to give people lots of hints and tips, some demos, um, just some ideas how to use it. So hopefully it'll become a nice community on there as well. So that's Amazing. that. And then the last thing I'm doing is um, working with Prim. Now, anybody who knows me and has known me for a long time knows I'm a Prim girl. Um, you know, I love my Prim products. So they've asked me to do a couple of videos um, for them as well. Um, um, they're, they're launching a new advent calendar, which isn't out yet, but um, I'm going to be doing a, a little sneak peek of the, of the advent calendar. Um, and then looking at things like, they call this a starter set. It's the wrong word in my opinion. It's the most perfect patchwork and quilting um, set. So I'm going to be looking well, at things like- That's roughly what I use um, automatically for all my FPP. Yeah, exactly. I've got the little table next to me with the little, yeah. and that's exactly what I do. It's brilliant. That, so what I'm going to do with the prim is basically how do I put the glue refill in? How do I put the pencil refill? So yes, I'm going to introduce some of the products, but also go back to, so you're not having to search, you know, it's broken. I don't know how to do it. Nine times out of 10, how to replace a rotary cutting blade, how to use some of their products because they have a huge inventory as well. So it's quite nice because I haven't got that, the restraints of TV telling me I, I, time's up. I'm going to be able to spend a lot of time and talking to people on their level or whatever level they want, but also hopefully answering questions that I've asked myself and that I know other people are asking. How wonderful. This is such an exciting time. Mm, it is. And I, see, I see it as yeah. a kind of culmination of everything that you've learned and everything that you've done, merging yeah. into one different, I think it's fabulous. It's just into one area, being able to just pass your expertise on. It's wonderful. That's right. And what's going to be nice is it's going to support the end users and the retailers as well, because I know when I used to have the shop and people would come in and say, oh, what's I want some violin, for example. And, I, and then I would have to say to them, well, well, what are you making? And it wasn't that I was being nosy because violin was... Different things are for different things. And Vlieseline is the brand name and it's it's try and the education is there. So it would be nice also if I'd been a retailer, a shop, to be able to say, oh, I'm selling this, but look, you can go on and onto a, a YouTube channel or a Facebook page and you can have all that information at midnight when I'm not open. <laughs> and it's just going to be a, a marvellous, hopefully a marvellous resource. Oh, I think it'll be fabulous. We had the, I had the, uh, one of the Vliesling reps come in and they had their little arch lever files yeah. showing you exactly what each thing does. And my, my ladies and I were sitting like, we want that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. And that one and that. And you, I don't even do dressmaking, but I'm going to have that one and that one. It's just so interesting. And I uh -huh. think it's off-putting that you don't, you just see, give me white stuff. stuff. It's just white stuff. And you're like, I have no clue how to use that. But then when you go down and break it down, it is so interesting to be able to do. I'm and so, that I white, love that. You know, it's a lot of things. It's like the tools that you use, the white stuff that we use and the threads that we use are so important because- Threads are so <laughs> important that people forget about the threads and nobody, we, we spend so much time on the fabric. We spend so much time thinking of oh, that fabric doesn't go with this, but then we're using really nasty, not, I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody's no, thread. No, I don't no. like that idea. But it's a case of you're spending so much money on fabric, but people won't pay the money for a, for a thing of thread that's going to hold it together for the rest of the life. And years ago, I went on a, um, a course with Coates Threads, and I, I thought, oh, I only went because it was a free lunch, I'll be honest with you. But it was one of the most interesting courses that I ever went on. And they explained about how a thread is constructed. Mm. And, for example, the folk threads, the reason that these are good, it's the, it's what, it's a bit like a coating. It's a bit like an oil that goes on the threads. It's not oil, it's the wrong word, but it's it's in the construction of the thread and that makes it so smooth. Because if you're using, you go back to the cheap threads, you're using threads that are cheap. Every I was always told by my nana, who was a fabulous sewer, it's cheap for a reason. Now you have all those bits, you can sometimes look at your threads and you've got all those little bits coming off. Pop them on your sewing machine. That's going into areas that you can't regularly clean. So therefore, you're going to have to have your machine serviced more regularly. Mm. That's another cost. Whereas if you use a high quality thread, a new needle every five to six hours of sewing time and the right needle, then you, your life is going to be so much easier. And you, whether you've spent £99 on a machine or a ridiculous amount on a machine, you still... It's a constant purchase and you still need to look after it. You wouldn't put 
Well, you, you look at it the way you're driving your car. If you're not putting oil in your car, you're going to, you know, you're going to cause major problems. Of and your car is a much bigger investment than a sewing machine, but it's yeah. still an investment. Yeah, exactly. Well, some some sewing machines are the price of small cars, I have to say. Well, yes. Now, um, some of the top shh, My husband's watching this. Shh. <laughs> We're not saying anything about the price of the machines. But you do have to look after them, you know. You, you really and, do. And to be fair, the other thing that people always used to think was that when you were piecing, that you had to have the right colour. So if I have red fabric, I need to have red thread, etc., etc. And you don't. No. When I piece, I use a cream or a grey, and, and that covers a multitude of sins. So I'd rather buy two good quality cream and grey for piecing than, spend, than have this wonderful spectrum of colours, but that are going to not give me the finished result, not going to bed into the, the seam correctly, and also potentially cause it be a headache with my soul machine i agree 100 percent. it's all you can do yeah Kim, absolutely. i cannot thank you enough for your time this has been the most you are wonderful welcome. thing i really appreciate it if anybody wants to get in touch with you what's the best way of doing that so i still have my email address which is sales at six penny.com i'm also on facebook under six penny memories and instagram six penny memories you'll see me pop up on the thread essentials facebook page as well so yes yeah, so just email i'm there and i still have a telephone so that I answer as well How but yes wonderful. please ask questions and i'm really excited i'm looking forward to seeing when you get all your patterns somewhere in one place to be able to buy yeah. those that'll be wonderful and i'm going to pop you some threads down as well for you to have a little play and show your ladies oh can't wait can't wait thank you all so much for joining us on this week's episode of course along with john i look forward to bringing you another fabulous guest next week kim thank you so much oh,